Hello, and welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. Today's episode looks at Battlefield 1, a first-person shooter developed by DICE and published by EEA, set in the First World War. Battlefield 1's historical setting represents a big departure for both the Battlefield series and first-person shooters in general. While many modern military shooters have been set in the Second World War, few have dealt with earlier conflicts. This transition to the First World War has also left many journalists and players concerned with how a profit-driven video game will depict an event which has attained a sacred stature in modern memory. Is it possible for a game that sells players on action and fun to also treat a sensitive historical topic with the respect that it deserves? Joining me on today's show to discuss this game is Chris Kempshaw, a historian of the First World War at the University of Sussex. In addition to writing traditional academic work on the First World War, Chris also studies the depiction of the Great War in video games, and is the author of The First World War in Computer Games, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2015. Hi Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So Chris, this game was the focus of a great deal of criticism prior to its release, uh, primarily because of what it was seen as a apparent heroic portrayal of the First World War. And many games journalists argued that the First World War represents a sacred and solemn historical event, uh, which should not be depicted in a commercial game. What did you make of this controversy? I think the controversy is very, very interesting. I mean, to begin with, we have to acknowledge that Battlefield 1 is not the first First World War game in existence. There, there have been others before it, um, and there, there are going to be others afterwards. Um, and I think that if you're going to compare a game to Battlefield, um, there didn't appear to be any kind of outrage about Verdun when it mm -hmm. came out the game, um, which I think is interesting. There doesn't appear to have been any um, outrage about any First World War flight simulator games when they came out or mm -hmm. Valiant Hearts when it came out. Um, so I wonder if some of the controversy is based around a belief, not necessarily a misplaced belief, that um, Battlefield 1 is taking things to a more kind of mainstream appeal, but also DICE and EA have never been known for being particularly subtle right. in their games. Um, and there was, I think there was a great deal of question about exactly how sensitively are they going to are they going to deal with this war? Um, but I think it's also worth flagging up that we don't get an awful lot of these types of controversy about Second World War games. And you can do everything in a Battlefield 1 that you can do in a Second World War game, and more in some aspects. I mean, there are some things in Second World War games that you'd never get. I can't imagine a situation where you'd ever play German soldiers in a Second World War game, for example. But then you don't play German soldiers in the campaign in Battlefield 1 either. Right. Um, so I wonder how much of the the controversy about it is based around the role that the war plays in our society and the way that we think of the war, as opposed to the way that we think about other wars like the Second World War, um, whether or not the First World War is seen as just being too sensitive to deal with. And I find that idea very interesting. Hmm. So moving on to the next question, uh, you know, you brought up the Second World War and, you know, when you compare Second World War games to First World War games, it's usually the case that First World War games are incredibly rare. And is this difference the result of something inherent to the First World War as a conflict? Or is this difference the result of something related to the mechanics of video games? In other words, is there something with video games that makes it difficult for them to approach the First World War? I think, to be honest, it's probably a mix of the two. I think for a long time that games developers and some players to an extent basically thought that the first world war was too boring to play and too grim to play um like a, if you imagine kind of what you'd imagine to be an archetypal first world war game it's going to be you're in a trench in the mud it's raining you go over the top you die no one's going to want to play that it's no fun also put alongside the fact that i think computer game development struggled with some aspects of the first world war AI, for example, um, has always kind of it's been part of an evolution, but trying to find or a way of kind of making enemy accuracy accurate, but also not so much that you go over the top and you immediately die, I think was a, a difficult balancing point right. for them. When you come to strategy games, I think games have struggled until fairly recently with trying to create the circumstances and the mechanics to have a game where you don't move around an awful lot fun. Mm. 
um, how do you recreate four years of static trench warfare and still make it an engaging strategy game? Mm -hmm. um, in regards to what, if there's a problem intrinsically with the First World War, I think that particularly in British culture, the First World War is seen as just being too sad and too pointless to want to really recreate in a, in a computer game. The Second World War has always had a much clearer narrative. I mean, the, the bad guys in it are so bad guy-ish <laughs> that they're almost kind of literally moustache twirling, evil cackling bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's no grey area in there. There's no, oh, I wonder how this whole Nazi thing is going to work out. They're the bad guys. They're killing everyone and they want to take over the world. You can sell that in a computer game. You don't need to worry too much about explaining things to people. Um, people already know who the Nazis are. With the, set, the First World War, who's a good guy and who's a bad guy is much harder to kind of really work out, particularly when you're starting from a point of view of, you know what, everybody kind of suffered the same in this war. No good came of it and no, there are no winners, there are no losers, which is kind of the way that the war is presented to us. How do you tell a story in that aspect and make it engaging if you can't, kind of, if you're not relying on the audience already knowing the main parts of the narrative? Right. Um, I am interested to get your view on how the game deals, especially in the very first uh, intro level, how the game deals with this kind of uh, trench warfare where you, you are presented with this mission at the very beginning where you're not expected to survive. And you go through playing yeah. multiple characters in the same sequence. And then after each time you're killed, uh, you take over another character. But before you do that, you are presented with the uh, full name and then the dates uh, for the life of the person you just lost. What did you think of that approach? I thought it was interesting. I, I've heard, and I need to play through it again, that those details and those names change every time you it play does. it. It does, yes. Um, I've played it twice. Fantastic, which I think is really interesting. And I I would strongly imagine that these are not real people mm -hmm. that they're putting you in. Um, I think EA and DICE would be well advised to stay away from that aspect. I think if you start putting people into actual control of soldiers who died that's when people are going to get started getting right. annoyed um as to the kind of the those opening levels in the trenches i thought and, it, and i still think a kind of across the game that the most interesting thing about battlefield one is the lack of time you spend in the trenches um they avoid them almost entirely you get them in that prologue level where you actually kind of get a feeling of what it, it must have been like desperately trying to hold back uh, a wave after wave of attack in the knowledge that, to be honest, you're not going to do it and you're probably going to die. After that, I think EA and DICE and Battlefield 1 basically avoid the trenches as much as they right. possibly can. The only time you ever have any levels or missions set before 1917, 1918 is in the Gallipoli mm -hmm. level in 1950, where you get a little bit of kind of running through fortifications and fending off some attacking enemies and the like. But they stay well away from the trenches after that because i think again similar to the kind of that idea that there's an element of the first world war that isn't fun to play constantly playing levels where all of your characters die you then find out about their age and their date of birth and their date of death and then you move on five feet down the line to their mate and then he dies um i think is a fantastic opening for a game but i wonder if basically it would become boring and it would lose some of its emotional impact if you stretched it out over the yeah. game I also don't think it, the the developers were particularly interested in making people defend yes. for any long period of time. I think they wanted people to be proactive, to be protagonists. And that means you've got to go forwards or you've got to sneak through no man's land back to your trenches as in the, as in the flying level. But I think they weren't interested in having a story or a theme in the game that you're holding out desperately against odds. They wanted you to be the active kind of driving force of the game rather than basically just sitting there like a tower defense or horde style game where the enemy are just going to come to you and you're just going to have to basically blast your way uh, through they it. wanted the players to have a sense of uh of the french term elon right they wanted them to uh yes uh, to throw Absolutely. themselves at the lines and you know uh use their their Anyone superior masculinity their superior force to overwhelm the enemy opponent <laughs> yeah absolutely they definitely wanted that yeah, and I think players would be a bit disturbed to discover how boring the First World War was for most soldiers. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when you read war diaries, when you look at, uh, you know, secondary literature on the war, one of the things they emphasize for the soldiers in the trenches is just 
how much you know how much boredom and tedium there was and how little fighting there often was and i think that that would be difficult to to relate in a video game yeah yeah i definitely think so i mean the the vast majority of soldiers spend their time sitting and digging and marching um mm-hmm. that's it the reason why the big attacks are so kind of uh, they produce so many casualties is because they're rare you couldn't carry on doing that constantly every day of every week of every month of the war um, right. So a kind of a, a super accurate First World War game would be the dullest thing you can possibly imagine. <laughs> um, you might not ever even see battle. You'd just be sitting yeah. around for, for months and months and years and years on end with a really historically accurate rifle that you never get to use. <laughs> um, and whilst you know that historical accuracy element will appeal to some people, gamers aren't going to want that. No one really wants to play a game where nothing happens. It would be even worse than like a walking simulator. It would be a sitting simulator. Mm. Mm. Uh, so if there's a prevailing narrative associated with the First World War, it's that it was a pointless and costly conflict. And Battlefield 1 cleaves very closely to this narrative by declaring in the opening moments that this was the war to end all wars that ended nothing. Yet, at the same time, the game admits that the war ended several major empires and led to the creation of many different nations. How well do you think this game handles this tension? I think Battlefield 1 handles it in the manner which has become fairly kind of stable and, and, and familiar for First World War games in that they, they declare that this is the war to end all wars and it ended nothing. They never actually really tell you what the war was for, what the point mm-hmm. of it was. They mentioned something at one point about old empires not being able to exert will or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But actually what the war was for and the outcomes of it are basically pushed to the side and i think this is a similar kind of result of the first world war not having a narrative that's as easy to understand as the second world war is and to talk about what the first world war was the point of it was for you're going to have to go into lots of kind of stuff about balance of power and great power alliances and increasing tensions and all of that type of stuff and, and the aftermath of it you're going to have to talk about revolution and um nationalism and Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and self-determination, right. all of which is hugely interesting to historians. It's not necessarily going to easily play itself out in like motion capture video game. So I think what Battlefield 1 do is basically ignore it. They mention, yeah. you know what, this is a big war. It doesn't really solve anything, but hey, look at this tank. And that's the approach that they that they take to it, that whilst there's all of this big stuff going on at the top, you don't, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to know about that. All you need to know about is the motivation of this one guy that you're going to control for the next yep. hour and a half. Um, yep. He doesn't care what the war's about. He doesn't care what it's about to produce. He simply cares about achieving his objective and living for as long as he possibly can. So they right. zoom in on the micro-individual level and just kind of ignore everything else that they possibly can. Yeah, I, you know, as I like to tell students, uh, there's no elevator pitch for the First World War. Oh. Uh, you know, in other <laughs> words, there, there's no real way to sum up that war uh, in the time that it takes to be in an elevator ride, right? So, no, no, uh, really it's really one of those things where you either kind of avoid, uh, you know, most of the history of the war, or you dive really deep into it and you end up spending weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, talking about it, um, and so you hit there's that emergency stop button on the elevator when you get settled in for a really long discussion. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, and you know, I think you know, I don't mean to, I don't mean to pitch this as something that Battlefield One is doing poorly. I mean, I would say that not many other fictions, uh, maybe not even many history books, do a very good job of yeah. dealing with the First World War in this way. So it's not something intrinsically wrong with Battlefield One. It's just something. That you know, I think it it comes across that the fact that uh, you know there's this tension between you know this is a war that you know ended nothing, but at the same time, well, we've got to mention the fact that it was hugely important to you know the end of empires, to the end of many institutions, and also the creation of new nations. So it's just one of those funny things, uh, I think. And um, you know, I think it's also you know you make a good point of uh, you know having it having the game, you know, pitched at the level of uh, personal narratives. I mean, I think that that gives the players something to connect to. uh, And it also helps them avoid 
you know, kind of the implications of being placed in a command position as well. Yeah. I mean, none of the players uh, or none of the uh, player characters in this game uh, are really in a command position, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, most of them are uh, recruits or they're, are, are, uh, you know, junior officers. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there is a little bit of an element of lions versus donkeys in this game, I think, in, for, in particular with the uh, the tank mission, where there's almost yep. a mutiny. Uh, I think also in the uh, missions involving uh, flying, uh, yep. of course, the, um, you know, the British uh, uh, aristocrat officer, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> who is basically your antagonist uh, during yeah. those missions. Uh, and then also with the Gallipoli missions, That's uh, the big one where me. yeah, where you've got uh, a British commanding officer uh, in charge of uh, ANZAC troops, uh, who actually has a what you might call a come to Jesus moment, literally, <laughs> uh, in a church, in a church where he admits uh, that he feels guilty about what's been going on uh, in this in this battle. Full scale retreat. They're going to shell the village in the fort to cover us. We need to get out now. I, I sent men up to secure the fort. A dead man. Who went? Only those who volunteered, so naturally all of them. Fucking kids. Well, you remember being his age? Foster. Fuck. I gotta get that kid. Go. I'll pretend I didn't see you. This isn't on you. Of course it is. One more death for me to live with. Go, go, you don't have much time. What did you, I mean, what did you make of that kind of, the use of personal narratives and then also the depiction of non-player characters in this game? I thought that Gallipoli level was possibly that, that interaction between between this kind of grizzled Australian veteran um, who is kind of embodying that guy in kind of war films who is just a soldier. He knows how to kill people. It's that kind mm -hmm. of, it's ingrained into him. He's like, uh, it's almost Clint Eastwood-esque. Um, yeah. And this kind of British officer who is embodying the empire and the power of Britain and these kind of, this burgeoning Australian nationalism manifested itself in this this rugged man who's far more kind of masculine than the british officer is um yes. and that kind of conflict between them was fascinating i thought that was one of the best parts of the game um the and then the way that that kind of british officer as you said kind of goes well i i wish i wasn't having to do this this is all terrible um it's going to cost all of you guys your lives i'm really sorry about that but you know basically britain isn't sorry about that at all um right was a, a lovely little snapshot into kind of some of those difficult relations between the allies um, and even between kind of allies of the same empire during the first world war some of the um other kind of uh, important characters but kind of basically npc characters were quite interesting i mean you mentioned the the flying uh, the pilot the aristocrat that aristocrat was basically ironed he wasn't born um he was carved out of like overly starched material. He was the most perfect <laughs> um, depiction of a of a stuffy, uptight British officer that you could possibly hope to find. Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of that was to kind of to pl to then kind of further expose how much of a of a renegade the character that you're playing is, how kind of not part of this world he is. Um, but I also wonder how much of it is about kind of slightly latent ideas about what it means to be British. And I'm thinking mm. particularly at the way that this game is probably being pitched to an American audience about right. what they think the British, either British people are or the British upper classes are. Because the guy was such a caricature. It was beautiful um, the way that he appeared in that um, I mean, the player's story is a kind of the individual war story, and which I suppose is what the Battlefield 1 actually calls the various chapters. They are war stories. I think is interesting because they've, they've tried to do a mix of two worlds when it comes to kind of first-person shooter computer games, but also particularly First, person, uh, first World War first-person shooter games, which is they want you to feel a little bit like you're just a cog in a machine. Yes. You're not you know, you're not Rambo, you're not Schwarzenegger in Commando, 
Um, you're just a guy in an event that is far bigger than you. That being said, if you want to be Rambo and, or Commando or anything like that, there are going to be opportunities for you to do exactly that. So you get to be just a guy, but you get to also be incredibly powerful if you want to. Um, yeah. You'll kill dozens of people. You can kill him with your bare hands. You can kill him with a spade. You can kill. You can. You know. You can kill a guy and steal his horse, and then kill another guy with the guy's horse. Um, you can do all of the kind of amazing actiony hero things, whilst at the same time being repeatedly kind of reassured that you're you're not a, you're not a big you're not like the main character in this war. There is no main character in this war. You're just this guy for the next hour. Whatever you choose to do with that next hour is up to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, just going back to your points about this kind of uh, stereotypical portrayal of uh, British uh, aristocracy and class, I love how uh, in the tank missions, uh, which is the the first ones uh, coming out of the the intro level, uh, you are are literally playing as kind of a Downton Abbey esque chauffeur, <laughs> yeah, who's now who's now in control of a tank. I thought I you know I watched that as an American. And thought, wow, they are really, they're really going after that American audience. Because yeah. I'm sure, you know, for most Americans, uh, you know, having any kind of uh, familiarity with British life would come through Downton Abbey, which is something that was far more popular in the States than I think even the UK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I really wanted from that tank level was like an extra element of realism where they all tumble out the back of it with carbon monoxide poisoning at some point um, <laughs> and with like ringing in their ears and I'm being unable to stand up it's that, inside of that tank is not a bad place to be in the game um yeah which I, I think is a slight departure from probably how it was in the war <laughs> just a bit just a bit we came from all over the world the innocent the arrogant and the brave. We thought the war was to be our rite of passage, a grand adventure that would make us all equal in our quest for glory. But instead of adventure, we found fear. And in war, the only true equalizer is death. As with most games, books, and films about the First World War, Battlefield 1 focuses on American and European soldiers throughout the conflict. Although the game takes place in more places than just the Western Front, players in the campaign never have the option to play as a member of the Central Powers, and they never see fighting in Africa, Asia, the Eastern Front, or on the high seas. Why do you think it's so difficult to find a depiction of the First World War that includes at least a brief mention of the entirety of this conflict? Um, I think this is a kind of a, a confluence of events. I think that... Um... A lot of the war and kind of the spread of the war is still, it, there is no place, there is no kind of, has no being in our social consciousness. Um, so we don't necessarily immediately recognize it. Um, to be fair to Battlefield 1, they do a pretty good job of some of the stuff that they bring in. I mean, I was talking to some people fairly recently and saying that if a few years back somebody had told me that in the next big Battlefield 1 game, you're going to play Italians storming a fortress held by the Austrian-Hungarians in the Alps, and everyone's going to play it. I'd have just laughed, because mm -hmm. that's never going to happen. It's mm -hmm. never going to happen. No one will ever do that. We can't even get that in, you know, in, in TV series in England about the war. So they have taken on a pretty impressive spread, but it is a, a fairly limited spread. Um, I wonder how much will come in the future. And I certainly remember that in early trailers, they talked, or they certainly had elements of like battleship fighting and stuff like that. Right. Like the, the early concept stuff, which in the game appears to have been limited to watching a dreadnought fire at Gallipoli beaches. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was cool, but I wanted to be on board with the guns, you know. So I wonder how much will be coming in the future because, as you, I mean, as you mentioned. They don't allow you to control any of the central powers, which I think is a, a hugely curious decision, um, given that parts of the game set up this idea that is you know, fairly prevalent in First World War and in First World War games. There are no bad guys. Right. Everybody suffers in this war. And if there are no bad guys, why can't you play as Germany? Why can't yep. you play as Austria-Hungary? What's the problem? What's the big deal? Now, they might have thought, we're going to shy away from that for we might get kind of tagged on sensitivity issues but they're getting tagged on sensitivity issues anyway 
Um, they were always going to get tagged on sensitivity issues. So I think it's very interesting that they don't have the Germans or the Austro-Hungarians in at launch. I think it's even more interesting that they don't have the French in at launch. Um, yes. I think you, you're you on particularly wonky ground if you're trying to justify any First World War game without mentioning the existence of the French army. Um, <laughs> which, particularly when you're doing stuff on the Western Front, I mean... The French fight the most battles, they have the most men, they hold the most line. There is no Western Front without the French. Yeah. Um, and similar to the Eastern Front with the Russians. Now, I know that the French and Eastern Front are coming as DLC. Um, oh, in oh wonderful. Um, which is great, because you have to have them in there. At the same time, because they're coming as DLC, my cynical marketing alarm has been going off <laughs> ever since I heard that the French and the Russians weren't in it and that they were going to be DLC later on. And I think what they've probably done is thought, well, we're, we're pitching this at a, at a particular Western audience, so basically Britain and America and then some people in Europe. So they're yeah. going to want to play the British and the Americans straight off the bat. Well, that's, to an extent, that might be the Western Front done then. We can do the French, we can do the British, and we can do the Americans, and we can worry about the French later on, and then we can go and do the Arabian Peninsula, um, and we can do Gallipoli, and we can do Italy, and that's that's a that's a decent base game. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what's then interesting from that is DLC is optional. You can choose to buy it, or you can choose to not. So what you end up with is that Battlefield 1's idea of the base, understandable level of the First World War doesn't contain the French, doesn't contain the Russians, and you can't play as the Germans. Yeah. Um, which is odd, I think, to say the least. Um, whether or not we'll ever get a spread wider than that, I wonder. I think they're going to shy away from doing anything in Africa simply because I think it's going to bring them into discussions of empire that they really don't want to get involved in. And I don't necessarily blame them for that because it's not simply a case of, you know, you're defending trenches in France so you can defend France and Britain. Um, when you start moving into the African Empire, you're defending imperial possessions full of people who are your subjects and undergo some of the worst um, treatment that you can possibly think of in the in the 20th century. This no one's going to come out of this looking good. Um, no yep. one's going to want to really get involved in the in the details of what it actually means to be a uh, an African subject of a European empire. So I think they're going to avoid it like the plague. Um, <laughs> whether or not they go into Asia. Maybe I hope they go into the sea at some point. I think that could be yes. Um, yeah. Whether or not they decide to do like a, a Jutland DLC or something like that, or I wonder whether or not they might end up bringing in U-boats or some mm, of um, too. Atlantic convoy raiding. That could be quite interesting and that could be quite fun. Um, but as for the other bits, Africa and Asia, I remain doubtful. Yeah, I think you're right about that, and I think the game, like you said, deserves some credit for at least expanding the knowledge about the First World War, particularly including Arabia, including uh, Gallipoli. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think that there's kind of an argument by absence going on here, you know, with not including France, not including the Eastern Front. You know, it's kind of sending a message to players that, you know, what's in the base game is what really the war was about. Yeah. And if you go off that, then you would assume that, you know, America played a dramatic role. Yes. In the First World War, and you would assume that all of the real fighting happened around 1917, 1918. You know, forget forget the Somme. You know, yep. forget any of the early battles. You know, um, so I I just you know it's kind of it's disappointing as a historian, as somebody who's spent a lot of his life studying the First World War. I you know I would hope for more. Yeah, it is hugely disappointing in that aspect, and even all of the narration, even for parts when, like in the Gallipoli thing, is done by the Americans. It's a, it's the kind of the yep. introducing of the missions, and that America isn't even in the war when Gallipoli is yep. taking place, and everything I think is basically viewed through the lens of American arrival in 1917 and 1918, and I think that ties into their the developers' urge and desire to have you be on the offensive as much as possible. So the breakdown of of static trench warfare from about March 1918, coinciding with the arrival of um, American soldiers in large numbers, means that I think they basically just try and leapfrog it. So they leapfrog the Somme, they leapfrog Verdun, they leapfrog Passchendaele, and just go straight to where they think the action is. And would you believe it, the Americans are there? <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, well, so Battlefield 1, like any game on a historical event or topic is filled with embellishments and outright inaccuracies. 
Were there any of these inaccuracies that stood out to you as being especially over the top, as it were? Uh, and for my part, I think I most enjoyed flying biplanes that could not stall. I tell you what, flying a biplane in the First World War was a hell of a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm reminded of, uh, particularly with that, there's um, flight simulator games that came out you know, years and years beforehand, where people protested when the developers included um, the option to make it easier to fly them because mm -hmm. they thought it would be disrespectful to the memory of the people who'd had to learn how to fly the real thing, which I think comes back to that argument about kind of realism versus actual fun. Um, right. First World War biplanes are incredibly difficult to fly. If you try and fly them accurately in a computer game, you're going to crash. Um, <laughs> and then the plane is going to stall. I mean, there were some other ones that I quite liked. Um, with regard to the tank level, um, which... I also think large parts of that tank, those series of tank levels, are basically the, the Second World War film Fury with Brad Pitt just played right. out in a First World War setting. Now, at various points in that, in those campaigns and in those levels, you come up against the German A7V tank. Now, there were only ever 20 of those built and put into battle. I think we, I blew up at least half of those over the course of that of that level i mean that that one guy in that one tank was having a hell of a day that he managed to see basically the entirety of the german tank a7b fleet um right. rolling towards him um there were various kind of little embellishments and stuff in there i mean they've got guns that are not widespread in use um mm -hmm. in the first world war and apparently everyone's carrying them um what they've clearly done is they've like they've trawled through the first world war's back catalog and found the stuff that they think could be interesting and could be fun, um, and then gone, well, you know, there are only 20,000 of these guns made. Well, what are you going to do? Everybody can have one because it makes it much easier to, if everyone's running around with the equivalent of a submachine gun. Um, it makes it more exciting. It makes it more dramatic. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll throw it in, and the people who notice, notice, and no one else is going to care. And I think that's an attempt, again, to basically make the game more action-packed, I've always had a slightly different approach to realism in computer games and even in films and stuff than some of my, my colleagues have. Um, and I understand their position that we want things to be realistic. We want things to be accurate. At the same time, the point of computer games and the point of films, the point of any media is for it to be fun. Yeah. Um, a game that is hugely historically accurate, our, our trench sitting simulator, you know, everyone's wearing exactly the right uniform. They've all got the right cat badges. They're eating, you know, time period specific food. No one's going to play it because it's dull. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that game is a failure. I'd rather that computer games and films didn't just make stuff up for the, for the point of narrative or for the point of whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, I've always been of the mind that there is plenty of drama and accuracy, or not accuracy, action and tragedy and humor and ridiculousness in the first world war in any other war you don't need to make stuff up there's there's loads of it in there you just need to go and find it that being said i think the job of accuracy and of informing opinion and of putting out kind of interesting nuggets of information and analysis about kind of the grand narrative is the job of historians we shouldn't right. be looking to computer games and films and tv shows to be doing our job for us what we should be doing is working more closely with computer games and films to ensure that we get the right messages out. It's not always easy. Uh, I have tried numerous times to try and get in contact with EA and DICE over Battlefield 1 to talk to them, and they're not biting, um, which is uh, <laughs> disappointing, particularly for me, because I, I, I've got so many questions I'd love to ask them. Yeah. Um, but, and even when you kind of collaborate on a TV show or a game, they're going to make an editorial decision based on what they think is interesting rather than what you think is interesting. Um, but my experience of talking to games developers, um, particularly the people who made, say, Verdun and uh, Jung Fenis, who made Valiant Hearts, mm -hmm. and, and the guys behind like the Great War mod for um, that came for Napoleon Total War, is the second that you tell them that you're like a historian and an academic and you want to talk to them about their game, they get really interested. They're kind of flattered buy it that you know you you think this is worth talking about you liked my game you, you enjoyed it you know people like to know that their stuff has been appreciated but what i end up walking away from is the feeling that actually if there's a problem with historical accuracy in computer games it's because not enough historians are getting involved um i think yeah. this one might be on us we didn't reach out 
And you know, I've been I've been trying to do a bit of that myself. You know, this this podcast, this uh, video series, also goes out uh, to Gama Sutra. You know, which is a yep. major website for game developers. And you know, occasionally I get some good feedback uh, from developers. Uh, you know, asking questions. Uh, but you know, there really isn't that kind of connection. And I think there really should be because you know, as I've argued elsewhere, you know, as you've argued before, you know it it really behooves uh, game developers to try to find the most interesting stories, the most interesting angles uh, with regards to these topics. And I think that historians can help them do that. Yeah. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, that's going <laughs> to do it. That's going to do it for our episode of history. Respawn. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. My absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of history Respawn and would like to support the show, please visit our page on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash history respond.